Hey everyone, it's Horror Free For All, and I hope you're doing well today. I'm finally ready to bring you my Tales From The Crypt Presents movie ranking. So, there's three Tales From The Crypt Presents films. We have Demon Knight, Bordello of Blood, and Ritual. Now, if you're not familiar with the history of these movies, you might not know behind the scenes, there are three films that are kind of considered to be almost Tales From The Crypt Presents movies like Death Becomes Her from Dust Till Dawn and The Frighteners. I'm not going to talk about those movies here, but I definitely want to review and discuss them somewhat soon. So stay tuned for that in the near future. And there is another movie out there that's kind of obscure. It was aired one time back in the early 90s. It's called Two-Fisted Tales. It was an anthology film starring uh, William Sadler playing like a Crypt Keeper knockoff. And they had three segments in that movie, Yellow, Showdown, and King of the Road, that were later put into the Tales from the Crypt TV show. But I decided not to talk about that one because, then again, it does not share the name of Tales from the Crypt Presents. So, we have three movies to talk about. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use this one to reference Demon Knight, and I'm going to use this one to reference Bordello of Blood because I only have the bind-ups uh, for these two universal uh, Tales from the Crypt Presents movies. And then I have this weird bind up that has Ritual on it because Ritual is a rare ass movie and it costs an arm and a leg just to get a DVD by itself of it. So I found this for really cheap and I'm happy to have this for the film. So yeah, let's go over the history real quick because uh, I think this is fascinating. So Tales from the Crypt Presents was kind of like softly pitched by the creators. Like I think it was A.L. Katz. Uh, what is it, Gil Adler, uh, Robert Zemeckis, they, these individuals were kind of responsible for getting the show on the ground to begin with. But there was like an idea and experimentation around the early 90s after the show hit a success with like season two and three and gaining a lot of steam into season four. They wanted to start making movies. And the first attempt, I guess, from what I gather online was Death Becomes Her. I think Robert Zemeckis birthed this as like a Tales from the Crypt thing, but then it later became its own thing. Same thing happened with The Frighteners later on after Demon Knight, and From Dust Till Dawn was actually a movie written by Quentin Tarantino that, you know, <laughs> later became a film over in Dimension. Uh, but those films aside, there was three intended movies when they finally decided to, you know, sit down and make these movies I think because Death Becomes Her had a lot of success and won some Academy Awards they had three films lined up I think it was Dead Easy, uh, Body Count, and Demon Knight and supposedly they looked at all three scripts and they chose Demon Knight first because they thought it was the strongest one and had the most faith in it and at the end of Demon Knight there was a tease for Dead Easy but it never came out because they canceled Dead Easy and Body Count and instead they went with Bordello of Blood. Now, Bordello of Blood was not their first choice. As a matter of fact, it was The Frighteners, written by Peter Jackson, which Zemeckis really wanted and actually had on board, but they decided to uh, make that its own film at Universal. And then the second movie from Dust of Dawn, they had a vampire flick. They were actually on board to make it. I think there was some consternation with Tarantino not wanting certain things changed in it, but there was going to have to be some happy marriage and ideas and cooperation. Um, he was making things difficult, and on top of that, Robert Zemeckis was leaving Universal after the Frighteners finished wrapping up filming uh, so he can go over to DreamWorks. So supposedly, from what I gather, in order to keep him happy and keep him on board with Tales from the Crypt and Universal in general, they twisted his arm by making his first spec script ever, which was Bordello of Blood, uh, and they made that as the second film. And when that bombed, the third planned movie, because they wanted to make three, never happened. But they did have a script, and the script was Ritual. And Ritual's script was a uh, remake script of a 1943 black and white movie from, I think it's RKO Pictures. It was called I Walk With a Zombie, but the, the new movie was going to be called Ritual, and they weren't going to do anything after Bordello of Blood bombed. They sold the script off to, I think, Miramax and Dimension. Years later, it got made. They took all the stuff out of it that was Tales from the Crypt that might have been in the original. And then they released it overseas. Well, 
select countries got the movie years later they wanted to bring it to the states people knew about the movie there was word of mouth and mild buzz um so they decided to retroactively go back and get the production company that made tales from the crypt even though they hadn't made anything in a while i think since the radio plays in 2000 um they decided to work with them to create a new crypt keeper opening and retroactively make this a tales from the crypt film hence ritual becoming the third and final tales from the crypt movie now with all that being said a long history of fuckery uh what are the movies right uh how would i rank them right so <sighs> All of three of these films, they run that 90, I think one of them, hold on, let me see the shortest runtime. An hour and 27 minutes for Demon Knight, an hour and 33 minutes for um, Bordello of Blood, and I think it's 106 minutes for Ritual. So they run that time frame. If you're interested in trying these movies, this is a quick hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes, giving some change here and there. Um, it, it, they're fun movies. Now... Are they the greatest things ever? No. Some people might argue Demon Knight is, but we'll get into that in a minute. Um, but I will say this. If you're a dedicated Tales from the Crypt person out there and you, you know, seen the whole show, you never tried these movies, just know going into it the messy history that I talked about. And um, as time went on, or I guess as the movies go on, the quality starts to kind of dip in the interest of it. Um, but with that being said, Let's start with the ranking. Now, at number three, the bottom of the Tales from the Crypt Presents movies is Ritual. Ritual, I gave it three out of five stars to. It's a low, decent movie. and I don't really get why there's hate for this movie online. I do see a lot more people these days giving it a fair shake and saying that, hey, you know, this isn't the worst movie ever, nor is it the worst thing in Crypt of all time. Uh, but it's not the best story and I have to agree here, it is a very sluggish film. For a 106-minute movie, the pace is all over the place. The concept starts to stretch itself very thin and get kind of repetitive during the mid-portion. And it doesn't really click on sometimes when they're trying to do certain effects because the CGI... Yes, there's CGI in this movie compared to the other two movies that had a strong reliance on practical effects... This one has very cheap Mortal Kombat Annihilation, uh, Drive Angry Level Bad, CGI going on. So, just know that. That aside, you have a stellar cast. You have Tim Curry, you have Craig Sheffer, you have Jennifer Grey. Three outstanding, you know, performers here. Uh, I, have, I don't remember the woman's name. What's her name? Um, Kristen Wilson. Uh, she hasn't had the greatest film career, but her character Caro in this movie was really cool. And honestly, the concept of this, I think, is the better version of Dead Weight, which was a 20-something minute segment from the Tales from the Crypt uh, TV show. I think that this was, you know, pretty sound for what it was. It's inoffensively fun. Uh, the concept is essentially about uh, this rich guy that lives in Jamaica. He's a white dude, uh, and he has, like, an estate with a bunch of, uh, you know, native Jamaicans working for him and stuff. And uh, he has this brother who might have this weird issue going on. And he has like these uh, moments where he kind of falls in and out of consciousness because he's locked in these uh, dream sequences and these visions of sorts. And it might be tied to voodoo magic, let's just say. And early on in the story, uh, we see a doctor die and along with one of his cohorts or some nasty graphic body horror there that's probably like the only real practical effects they use in the movie uh, <laughs> but after that point when the doctor dies uh we meet jennifer gray's character who's over in the states she's a, a licensed medical practitioner but she accidentally gives an experimental drug to a kid which results in the kid's death and now she's haunted with visions and nightmares about this girl and uh, she's been barred from participating in at the hospital for like a few years so she's unemployed and she gets a call and a lead to come down to Jamaica and become this new doctor for this rich family. And when she does, and when she gets there, she realizes that something might be off on this property. And as the story goes along, um, she might start developing romantic feelings for this guy's brother. She starts to make friends with this woman named Caro, played by Kristen Wilson. 
And then she also starts to feel some visions that might be associated with the guy's brother. And she starts to see this phenomenon that's kind of plaguing everybody that's around this family. And there's a mystery involved with that. And people are actually dying in like a mild slasher way of getting hacked to death, to death with a machete, essentially. So it builds and builds this tension, kind of. Not really, but it's kind of there. And then by the end, you you realize who the real culprits behind the whole thing were. And uh, there is a double-decker twist where there's obviously one character that you can kind of see coming. But there's another character you really don't. Um, and yeah, it kind of has a quirky, happy ending for a Crypt movie. Uh, there are some episodes with like that sometimes. But um, yeah, that's Ritual in a nutshell. Uh, the atmosphere in this movie, I think, is easily the best of all three movies. I, you know, I don't mean anything against Demon Knight or Bordello of Blood. They had some fine set pieces for those films, but being immersed on a Caribbean island in this film makes it so engaging. I don't know what it is about it. Um, the, the setting is beautiful. Um, some characters are really fun. Like, Tim Curry plays, like, this pervert Walmart dad, and he's hilarious, uh, in that pervy way. Like, he doesn't go too far with it, but <laughs> it's kind of fun. Um, Jennifer Grey and Kristen Wilson both give some fantastic fan service. If you're into some skin, uh, these two gorgeous women on your screen at pretty much all times makes the movie at least decent. Honestly, uh, Jennifer Grey, she gives a fantastic performance in this. Easily the best performance of the entire film. Uh, and she seems like the only person that really gave a shit. Maybe she was there for a paycheck for this script. I couldn't fucking tell you. But I think she did splendidly well for this film. And honestly, when we're getting down into the story, I do like the mystery aspect to it. I do think it's engaging for the most part when the story is actually focused on it. When it gets into like the day-to-day -day life banter and the repetitive bad CGI visions, that's where it starts to suck. Uh, but... Um, yeah, the story was kind of interesting, um, and yeah, w when the gore was there, it was nice, but the negatives here, like I said, it's a slog of a movie, it's about 106 minutes, it takes forever to get there, the pace is hit or miss, there are some bad acting performances in here, like there's a Jamaican pol uh, police chief, he's a terrible actor, uh, <laughs> that guy sucks, um, but yeah, that's there, um, the CGI, look, let me just say this now. There's scenes with spiders and, like, having worms crawling out of people's hair. Those are bad scenes, but I think the one of the worst CGI sequences I've ever seen in my life has to go to uh, when Jennifer Grey and this one guy, they're driving in a Jeep on, like, a back road. There's a scene with Roots. That was beyond terrible. <laughs> beyond terrible. And there's also some weird dialogue issues with this movie. Occasionally you'll get scenes where you have people talking all over each other, uh, that I've never really seen that in a movie. Like, is that an e editing error? Did they mess up the timing on the dialogue? I don't fucking know. Uh, but it's pretty lazy, in my opinion. And uh, the dream sequences do get very, very, very repetitive. It gets to the point you can't tell a discernible difference between actual events in the movie and dreams. And that's fucking frustrating. Um, uh, and that's about it for Ritual. That's why I have it at a decent. For a film... It has some pretty solid positives, uh, but the negatives do kind of put it here. <laughs> Hefty negatives with that one. All right, so at number two, we have Bordello of Blood. Now, Bordello of Blood uh, was the second movie in the franchise. Like I said, this was uh, kind of made to appease Robert Zemeckis, essentially. This was based on the spec script he wrote in college. And the, and the best way to put this movie up front to you is that this is a vampire sexploitation movie. It's not quite erotica or in that kind of vein of a horror film where you just have like softcore porn sex smut going on. Now this is just using nudity and the, in, in a, in a lowbrow kind of way. So that's why it's a sexploitation kind of thing. Um, but the concept of this one... Uh, you know, it's a, it's a, well, let's just talk about it. Um, oh, wait, I got the times mixed up. This is actually the shorter film of the two, uh, between this and Demon Knight, but that's beyond the point. Okay, so let's get back to um, Bordello of Blood. So the concept of this one, 
uh, is, is kind of intriguing at first. You have uh, this explorer in this prologue. He's off somewhere, I guess near South America somewhere. He has a group of his toadies with him. They venture into this tomb where this ancient vampiris uh, is said to be. And the guy's carrying like fraction pieces of this heart. And he's saying to the to the people that he's with that if he puts the heart in the chest of the vampire, um, she'll come back to life. And they don't really believe them. Um, but once he puts the heart nearby and he gets the heart coming back together and puts it in the chest, the vampire reanimates and we get some grisly body horror and uh, bloodshed off the bat. And you, we, we see a cameo of a certain item that was in Demon Knight uh, that I guess was a throwaway gag. I guess they were trying to like just have some sort of continuity going on. I don't fucking know. Um, but the guy has some power over this vampire who ends up being this woman named Lilith. And Lilith is played by, uh, what's her name? Angie Everhart. And she's absolutely breathtaking. <laughs> Let's just say that. And uh, it cuts to present times. Uh, once we get through a uh, little interruption with a uh, Crypt Keeper, where we get caught up with these other characters, a brother and a sister. The sister, she's like uh, a news anchor or she works for a news station. And her brother's kind of like a burnout, like washed up guy. He has piercings. He's into like metal music. He doesn't really have much of a life. And he's wanting to go out one night to get laid, essentially. And he goes out and meets his friends at this dive bar essentially and while they're talking and they have these weird things where they're throwing darts at each other's nuts uh, this one idiot guy at the bar mentions that there's uh pretty much a brothel hidden in the back of this uh mortician's home and if you say this right passcode when you go up there he'll take you to this uh, brothel to meet women essentially so two two um two guys from the group one played by Corey feldman who is the news anchor uh, news anchor's brother and one of his friends end up going there because they're trying to get lucky and when they get there they say the passcode they're allowed in and they're taken to like this room with a coffin they're thrown down like some weird ass mine shaft thing and they enter the bordello and there's just tits everywhere <laughs> just all over the place unlimited boobage uh you know pick what you want essentially uh but it turns out that uh, Lilith is there from the prologue, and as you can guess, all these women are vampires. And uh, it's not too hard to imagine what happens to these two gentlemen. Well, because he goes di and disappears, his sister goes to the police. And she's like, I need somebody to help find my brother. And they're like, we're kind of booked up. We have too many cases. Why don't you look into private investigators? So she finds this guy named Rafe, who is played by, what's his name, Dennis Miller. And, uh, <laughs> Rafe is a funny character. I think he's probably one of the best characters in this whole movie. Uh, he's a sleazebag and he's, you know, has the hots for this woman essentially. And he agrees to go pretty much cheap and pro bono just to like be around her and maybe hit on her. Um, so that's introduced rather quickly, but then it starts to get kind of strange when we get caught up with the Explorer guy and what he's doing. Uh, he's tied up with this, uh, evangelical, you know, or te <laughs> televangelist priest <laughs> played by Chris Sarandon and uh, supposedly he's hidden this key that holds the power over Lilith inside of a safe at this church and there's some type of embezzlement scheme going on with the bordello that's in the back of the mortician's home and bodies that are turning up there where the mortician is collecting like jewelry and gold teeth from the victims and that's how the church is getting money unbeknownst to the televangelist uh, but uh, <laughs> the Explorer guy knows. And uh, let's just say, as the story goes along, uh, the private investigator starts to kind of prod around the um, the area, trying to find out what happened to the girl's brother. And he retraces the steps to this bar. He finds the breadcrumbs that led to the bordello. He has a near encounter there. He uh, starts to snoop around, follow certain people. He finds his way back to the church starts to piece it together he tries to convince the girl that this is what's going on she doesn't really believe him but uh now he's more determined than ever to kind of prove this is what's going on and once some information starts to leak certain people start to pick up on that and uh, there's a change of plans with the explorer guy and lilith and uh trying to double cross this uh televangelist well this pisses off the televangelist um and there's a certain thing that convinces 
the guy's sister that everything that Dennis Miller's character Rafe was saying was true. And this builds up into the climax of the story where essentially um, uh, he gets the help <laughs> from the televangelist and um, the guy's sister to go into the bordello to find her brother. And when they do, they figure out what happened to Corey Feldman's character. Um, and there's just absolute uh, magic going on. <laughs> and, and let's just say it's super soakers and holy water. It's fucking awesome. And that it carries over into this church for a second climax, essentially, with just Lilith, Dennis Miller's character, and Corey Feldman's sister, uh, where um, we have this over-the-top climax dealing with, like, some, let's just say, church lights. And uh, we think the story ends there, but it's not quite over because of the twist. So that's essentially what you'll expect at a bordello of blood. Um, yeah, the ending is kind of cheesy, but one thing I loved about this movie up and up up front is how unapologetically sleazy it is it knows what it's trying to be and i've seen a lot of people try to dismantle this movie for saying oh you know you try to have you know a violent movie and then you end up cheesy and sleazy no it was like that from the get-go if, if you're gonna dismantle something for what it's trying to be um at least have some sound reasons as to why it's not a good one uh don't say that it's bad because it's that um, that's the wrong approach, in my opinion. But, um, let's start off things I love. I love Dennis Miller in this movie. I love Angie Everhart. They're both fantastic. Chris Sarandon in this was on the nose. As a matter of fact, Corey Feldman's in this movie. He was in Lost Boys. Chris Sarandon was in Fright Night. It's on purpose, and I think it's the awareness there that makes this movie fun. And having, like, vampire, you know, actors or actors in vampire movies from the 1980s in this makes it fun um the over the top stuff and i even scratched the surface with the body horror because i don't want to spoil it there's a ton of kills in this movie that are absolutely brutal maybe not as brutal as demon knight or maybe not even as gross as the one graphic death in ritual um uh, but these are fun ass kills and when i'm talking fun when you watch this climax, if there's anything else, if you don't like the plot of this movie, if you don't like the characters, if you think this plot is really dumb, I get it. But the climax of this is magical. It's B-movie at its best. The double climax even works as well. Uh, great stuff. And to be honest, I think this movie does feel longer, even though, you know, I did fluff up the times. Uh, Demon Knight's actually the longer movie, not Bordello of Blood. Um, but this movie feels longer, and it's like five minutes less than Demon Knight. Uh, so that's saying a lot. <laughs> uh, because when we're getting into the negatives of, the, of it all, the whole setup of the story feels... It's cool and all, but as the story goes along, we start to get these bullshit answers um, and, like, unbelievable things going on with certain characters like the televangelist not knowing uh about this bordello and, and this key i mean he knew about the safe he knew that there was something in there he knew he was getting money from this um mortician's home why would you think you're profiting that much money to be able to have like a like a legitimately huge million dollar uh, church that you work in uh do you think that you're getting that just from people paying like a few thousand dollars to bury somebody that's bullshit uh you you telling me that that that's a thing in the story unbelievable as shit uh and they even try to go double down on it at a certain point where he's like trying to confront the explorer and lilith and let's not even get into the bullshit involving the key from demon knight and how that's completely wasted in the story and we never actually get to see how this fucking key possesses power over lilith i guess it's implied that there's christ's blood in it from demon knight leftover i don't fucking know it's unexplained uh why that shit is even in there is dumb as hell um and let's get into the plot and the pace at first it's fun it's just dumb fun the characters are idiots they're you can like love to hate them or hate to love them it's either or honestly uh but once the plot kicks on it does feel very tedious it's just we're going back and forth to the bordello to the church to the bordello to the church 
uh, it's just a little scatterbrained and it's it's not focused enough and it's not interesting enough and honestly we already know who the fucking villain is and that's probably the biggest detriment to this whole story we as the audience know exactly what's going on in the bordello we, we are waiting at a snail's pace for these characters to piece it together and I, I don't mind that narrative structure when it's done well or captivatingly but this movie does not execute it well uh, honestly it gets into that bad like like kind of bad executed territory um and yeah <sighs> coupled with like i said the corny ending as well there's a lot of negatives to this film to make me think that it's you know traditionally a bad movie i can totally see why this bombed at the box office why this killed the steam of the tales from the crypt presents movies but if i'm being honest with myself i put asterisks next to this movie and i say that this is a legitimately so bad it's good film yes it's not traditionally good it's so bad it's good um and it, i don't know there's just something about it that makes it revisitable at least more revisitable to me than ritual and i've seen some people say that ritual is their second favorite and bordello of blood is their absolute least favorite um, i just think this movie's more fun than ritual uh but if we're kind of going off that charm base if you take out that from this movie i think this would score less than ritual if i'm being honest but um yeah there we go bordello of blood second place but first place goes to demon knight now demon knight is by far the best tales from the crypt presents movie i gave this movie a four out of five stars this was the only one out of the original three intended for this franchise um at least out of the original three intended tales from the crypt presents movies to get made and this was absolutely fantastic i mean you have billy zane william sadler um you know the list goes on thomas hayden church um why am i blanking on her name J jada pinkin smith uh, all of these people in this movie bring something fun to it and honestly it has one of my favorite concepts i've seen in a horror film especially from the 90s this is a fantastic 90s horror movie especially coming after that era in the late 80s kind of bleeding into around 1990 91 where the mpaa was just gung-ho on censoring pretty much every single horror movie uh, because practical effects in the mid 80s started to get really gnarly and really out there and people were starting to push the envelope to outdo each other i mean fuck we had brutal ass kills on friday the 13th we had jeff goldblum's body falling apart in the fly they were starting to crack down on some shit um but in the 90s we got demon knight and that kind of reinstated my faith in humanity a little bit um this one has like i said my favorite concept this one's about this guy his name is breaker he's running away from this guy called the collector breakers played by william sadler and uh the collector is played by billy zane and they're on this road chase they crash their vehicles and this gets the attention of some nearby police breaker escapes he heads to this nearby town and uh tries to you know blend in and acclimate and see where he can hide out for a little bit while the collector is left behind to deal with the police and the collector manages to convince the police that some guy took this briefcase of his and he wants it back and he's like uh this was a, basically a hit and run uh if you can assist me take me to town i think he went that way anyway uh, so the cops assist him take him to town while breaker finds this like halfway house where a bunch of like i guess people that put up for the night or i guess town residents live in it goes to this like shanty uh type of place where it's kind of wide open it's almost kind of like a prison <laughs> when they walk in it's not a, a traditional hotel you have stairs up to rooms and the rooms overlook down to the lobby below and that's how the movie's presented uh but once he's in there there's a whole cast of characters you have a prostitute a male guy a few police officers of course you have the hotel lady that runs the joint uh you have her niece that lives there played by jada pinkett smith um list goes on so while breaker's there he's hiding out and uh he stashes something away uh and uh he's been drinking a little bit with this one guy uh but the collector and the other cops show up and once the collector comes in he's like i want what's mine and uh one of the guys kind of rat out on break on breaker and expose that he did hide something and once once this happened pretty much the shit hits the fan and um, the collector is being taken away 
uh, for police, you know, investigation. They're going to arrest them both and take them to the police station. And then the collector decides just to punch a hole right through <laughs> the fucking police officer's head. This freaks everybody out. And Breaker immediately takes the key, this key that's inside of this briefcase, um, and starts to tell everybody to, you know, get behind the doors and, and help try to secure these uh, windows around the building uh, and for good reason. So he starts to pour out this like blood liquid that's inside of it, the key and starts to seal off doorways and windows so uh, the collector can't come back inside. And then Breaker starts to pretty much reveal uh, what's going on. There's this prophecy, and I didn't already talk about it yet, but there's like these uh, tattoo symbols on his hand that total seven stars. And these stars represent keys, uh, keys to the power of God and heaven itself. And a long time ago, it was said that God had to cast out uh, whatever void beings, uh, which are now known as demons, uh, that resided in the universe. So when he created heaven and brought light to it, and this ties into Genesis, according to this story, I'm not saying the actual Bible, just clear on that, um, God cast out all seven keys across the entire universe. Well, over time, um, the demons collected six out of the seven. And the seventh one was on Earth. And once the demons realized that it was on Earth, uh, they tried to start an uprising and turn people against it. And God kept thwarting, you know, time and time again. But then he came up with this ultimate solution by, by birthing a son who became Christ. And when Christ died, uh, it said that his blood filled the key, which uh, was said... From then on out, to whoever had the key bestowed to him, uh, they had to protect it, and it's going to be their protection because whatever this key touches, if it touches a demon, for example, it will pretty much kill them instantly. Uh, and they know that. So the only thing they need to do is get rid of the blood inside of the key, and they can take it, and then they have all seven to unlock the gates of heaven and cause who who knows what reality calamity they can cause. Um, so... Now that the characters know that, there's also another side effect to the prophecy that Breaker's kind of withholding. And he, he kind of slowly reveals that as, as people are dying in the story and as the Collector kind of uses his makeshift plot powers because plot said so. You know, I totally forgot to skim, uh, skim on this with Lilith, but similar issues with Lilith in Bordello of Blood where there's these random powers that just happen because plot says so in both films. But co the Collector gets his way with a few characters and there's some grisly transformation scenes and body horror involving that grisly deaths uh like people getting ripped apart the the hotel lady gets her arm ripped off in a graphic as fuck way holy shit um and you know they they have to kind of navigate this uh halfway house to survive and they try different rooms they realize that it leads to one area they head down below to see if the demons can get through there and uh, they end up finding this little boy, uh, and they kind of rescue him, bring him into the group. Uh, but when doing so, they get the attention of some demons, and they have to make a new seal. And um, over time, these seals that they have get broken because the collector's making his way inside. Um, so what ends up happening is they pretty much... <laughs> it's like a dungeon crawler story where they, they have to go here, then here, and then uh, they get retrace back upstairs and uh at a certain point with like five or six left they realize that the prophecy is coming true and breaker kind of starts spilling the real truth that only one of us is going to survive and the characters have to understand that this is like a biblical prophecy uh, this is out of their hands and um they have to accept their fate and like two characters kind of selflessly take themselves out uh with things that are found but the other ones like the little boy and this alcoholic guy, um, you know, the collector has a little bit of struggle with. The same thing applies to Jada Pinkett Smith's character, who he tries to break through to, uh, but um, uh, but the collector tries to get to her as well and doesn't seem to work. But it, it ends up being like, when it gets down to four people, uh, the alcoholic guy gets convinced in his <laughs> dreams in an over-the-top way with some, uh, let's just say, a bunch of naked women uh, to go on the collector side. He gets taken over, uh, not without a cost. And then it goes to the little boy. The boy has a fucking gnarly transformation. They have to do something to the boy, which injures Breaker. And then uh, Breaker, knowing that the collector is nearing, 
near and to the last uh, seal that they have. Um, he tells uh, Janet Pinkett Smith's character that she's going to be the next person to carry on uh, the tradition of protecting the key. And it's kind of sad to watch what happens to Breaker, but essentially Janet Pinkett Smith is left to uh, deal with the collector. And there's a whole climax where uh, she has this idea to take care of him and it may or may not work. And we see the collector's true real demonic form there. Uh, and the story ends off in a, kind of a cycle of the prophecy kind of way where we know the story isn't over because it's never been over and it's going to keep going, but um, she knows better and she knows what to look out for. Uh, so that's essentially Demon Knight. In Demon Knight, uh, you know, I think this, the, the soundtrack of this movie is a one thing that I think really stands out. There's a lot of, you know, 80s and 90s metal music in this movie. And it's fucking awesome. I think Pantera's in this. Hell yeah. The soundtrack is amazing. The mood and the score is absolutely fantastic. The characters are awesome. The acting performances, I've already brought this up. William Sadler, Jada Pinkett Smith, and uh, Billy Zane. Easily the three best performances in this film. I love William Sadler and pretty much everything he's in. I love Billy Zane to death. I think he's criminally underrated, especially in his later career where he started to get, you know, declining roles. He was a treasure in the 90s, man. He was in a lot of good fucking movies. Titanic, not, you know, I think that movie's great, but kind of overrated. Uh, and he was in The Phantom. Uh, I love that movie. And I don't care what the fuck people say. I loved him in that episode from Crip, Well Cooked Hams. I mean, William Sadler. He played, um, what was it, The Grim Reaper and Bill and Ted. He played, um, uh, he played the character, the main character in the first ever Tales from the Crypt episode. I mean, William Sadler is an absolute legend, too. I think he was in Die Hard as well. Guy's fucking awesome. I mean, what a great stellar cast. The atmosphere to this uh, story, it being like a dungeon crawler, uh, trying to survive the night, brought a lot of tension to the story. It made it really eerie in, in a lot of ways. Every time they went to a new uh, nook and cranny, you're kind of on your edge because you're like, okay, what if they open a new new thing here? Is this going to break a seal or do they have to make a new one? And when these demons show up, these demons are fucking creepy as hell. Um, especially that one scene where he first summons them and he cuts his hand open. That shit was gnarly, bro. Um, the, the, body, the body horror, the practical effects in this movie fucking rocked. Um, and yeah, the concept slaps. I really like it. I like the boldness to it. Uh, there's something about it that just really sticks out and is super memorable. I've never seen anything like this before. It's a very unique horror film. I almost put it up there in the top five, like, movies that don't really feel like anything else, um, that I've ever seen. Um, it's kind of like that Halloween 3 season of The Witch kind of thing. Um, so yeah, it has a lot going for it. And, you know, I haven't brought up the Crypt Keeper segments. So I kind of want to save that. But this also equally has the most feeling to an episode out of the three films. I mean, they all have the Crypt Keeper in it. But this one, stylistically, how it's framed and how it's brought to the audience, sets it up exactly like a Tales from the Crypt episode would. And ends it off like it would as well. Um, so, yeah. Great movie. But it does have some flaws. I've already brought up the collector's powers being a catch-all thing. Uh, you can go back, and if I didn't add it for Lilith there, that's also another negative for Bordello of Blood. Uh, but the catch-all powers where Plot wills it, it's absolutely kind of bullshit. Like, he can, like, mind-control people. He can uh, summon demons out of his hand with blood. He can, uh... <laughs> There's a certain thing he does with... He can, like, put himself into a comic book. Okay, he's he's just a trans-dimensional being, I guess, which I guess that's what they're going for. I mean, if he's from a plane of existence we can't physically see, but it can affect reality itself, I, I can kind of let some of it slide. But honestly, there's no real consistency with him. You feel like every interaction he has with a character is something new. Um, and <laughs> I guess that's fun if you, if you like that stuff, if you like things not being like, the same old style kill in a movie or whatnot, um, or same setup for a death or something, but it got a little bit, you know, eyebrow raising for me, and it, I found that as a detractor. There's also something 
uh, going on here with certain characters that, uh, yeah, what? Uh, like the, 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 the Tom and Hayes, Thomas Hayden Church sex scene with a the prostitute. They're playing Pantera, and he has his damn nipples held up to a car battery. What are we watching, people? <laughs> what are we fucking watching? I'm sorry. Um, that was bizarre as shit. Um, and yeah, like, you, you know, we're getting into the pace of it. It, it does feel at one point... We're in, when you're in, especially when you start to feel kind of fatigued with the concept when you get around like to the 40 minute mark because at this point of the story so much of just build up has happened that you're kind of waiting for a release and while you get little bits and bouts there I feel like the movie takes its sweet ass time building up parts of the story that we're wondering for so long and it kind of loses my intrigue at like that range until breaker starts to be more upfront and honest about everything i, I just felt like it, it took a little while to get to what the story was going um and you know the biblical stuff um while i'm not usually a fan of this kind of subgenre, i guess of like using biblical stories or biblical mythos or whatever to build horror around i mean i can kind of see the appeal there because I don't know what it is about it for me, but when I stare at, like, very old religious paintings, there's something that makes me feel... I don't know. I don't know how to explain it, but it makes me feel off. And this movie does succeed at it, but... Um, yeah, there are some things that are definitely going into that, you know, we're kind of pushing boundaries here, especially if you're, like, super religious. I don't, I don't see many people getting upset with this movie, per se, but... I can see it if you have an offense to it. And, you know, that's probably the film's least worrisome problems, honestly. Most most of my issues with this movie comes down to, like, nitpicky things, if I'm being for real. Um, just little things that kind of added up on my enjoyment of it. Um, but, yeah, easily my favorite of the three Tales from the Crypt Presents movies. So, that being said, kind of recapping, we're going to go from... Uh, the worst to the best. Well, I hate to use this term worst because it's not really bad or anything, but uh, it's the least enjoyable, I should say. Uh, number three, Ritual. Number two, Bordello of Blood. And number one, Demon Knight. Um, I had fun watching these movies like I had fun watching the seven seasons of Tales from the Crypt. Um, in my opinion, we, and I also did do a panel with a few of my horror friends uh, Metal Horror Bruce and BD Horror. We talked about the failed spinoff series and what that meant for Tales from the Crypt. I do think that it was kind of a big swing for Tales from the Crypt to go to film, but I also think it did not pay off whatso whatsoever, and it did affect the steam of the show in some ways, um, and that had lasting ramifications on the franchise. Uh, the fact of the matter is, I think this is probably the messiest tr trilogy I've ever seen, period. Going from a movie like Demon Knight that was supposed to be with Dead Easy and Body Count, having those two movies scrapped, and then getting a, a vampire Bordello of Blood film uh, just to keep Robert Zemeckis happy, and then that movie bombing so bad that when you had to wait so long just to get a movie, uh, the third intended movie, Ritual, which was released not as a Tales from the Crypt movie, but they went back and added some Crypt stuff and the Crypt Keeper stuff to make it look like tales from the crypt uh which brings me to the two of the crypt keeper segments um <laughs> the first movie demon knight like i said it is absolutely amazing how they set up this movie it feels like a tales from the crypt episode and honestly this has my favorite of all time crypt keeper segment bar none uh and it's not for the uh titillating stuff going on uh but it's just absolutely fantastic and even the outro is fun as hell. They nail this. Once you get to Bordello of Blood, you don't really, f you don't get an opening like a Tales from the Crypt episode. It just kind of kicks on into the prologue, and then the Crypt Keeper kind of interrupts after the prologue, and you see William Sadler as like a mummy, and uh, that kind of plays into the ending later, which we do get a traditional Crypt ending with the Crypt Keeper and the mummy that was kind of humorous. But uh, yeah, still felt like a Tales from the Crypt movie. And then you get ritual which 
they added last minute so the animatronic looks like shit. They put Crypt Keeper in <laughs> Jamaican dreadlocks, and I'm not fucking kidding. And he has a Jamaican accent. They got John Cassier to come back and voice the Crypt Keeper. He was amazing uh, for that. And some of the puns actually were funny, but he's with a bunch of girls in bikinis making <laughs> jokes at, you know, about Jamaican culture. And uh, yeah. <laughs> but, it, you know, this has to be my least favorite Crypt Keeper segment of all time. Maybe next to a handful of season one or two ones that are just really bland. Um, but, you know, going from demon knight and how well done the crypt keeper segments were to this it is a stark contrast so just know that going into it if you're a fan of john kassir or you're a fan of the crypt keeper uh he does progressively get the shaft more and more as these movies go along um so there's that for you if you care for that um but yeah that's my thoughts and ranking on the tales from the crypt presents movies let me know down in the comment section uh how you would order these in your ranking What's your favorite? What's your least favorite? What do you like about these movies? Uh, what do you not like about these movies? Have you seen all three? Have you only seen the first two and never have seen Ritual? I know Ritual's kind of obscure. Uh, I'm dying to know. I'll see you next time.